Pleasure, pleasure. Thank you so much, Bryony, for that welcome. And um, I'll just continue on from what Bryony said. I'm actually a Warwick alum. And the story of ANACED, so ANACED, African Network Against Extrajudicial Killings and Enforced Disappearances. The story of ANACED actually has a strong Warwick connection because the founder of ANACED and I attended Warwick at the same time and the friendship flourished here. So we have a personal connection to the university and it's really, um, we're really thankful to be invited to speak, Bryony. Thank you so much for the introduction. So um, what I want to do when I get into my talk really before I start is just give a bit of context to the work that we do. And a lot of the work that ANACED does is founded in the Gambian context. So um, for those of you who may not know, and some of you may know already, but I'll just start from the beginning that in um, 1994, there was a coup in the Gambia. And during this coup, the, it was a military coup and it overthrew a democratically elected um, um, president at the time. And the purpose of the coup was to, um, these soldiers came and they said they'd be soldiers with a difference. The intention was they'd stay for six months and then transition into um, power. Of course, that didn't happen. What happened, in fact, was that in those two years, they ran a, quite a repressive regime. They, um, they, um, they were, there were extrajudicial killings, enforced disappearances of dissidents, of persons accused of plotting counter coups. And in 1996, what happened is that there were elections. So essentially, the military men took off their uh, military uniforms and put on civilian ones and became a civilian government. And from 1994, we're starting with the coup and going all the way to 2016, we have 22 years of dictatorship. And in that dictatorship, there's completely no rule of law, no um, killings, in crimes against humanity take place with impunity. So you have, you know, torture, arbitrary arrest and detention, enforced disappearances, extrajudicial killings. And the targets of these crimes are basically anyone who's suspected of being a real or perceived threat. This could be anybody. This, were, this was, um, you know, journalists persons accused of overthrowing um, the government. This was um, lawyers, members of the judiciary. This was also, um, you know, persons like migrants. It could be anybody really. And we do have in some cases, even the president's own relatives have been disappeared. So really no one was immune. You have cases of persons from the diaspora coming home and being suspected of being mercenaries and then being disappeared and later found out to be killed. And this was a, a pattern of violence that went on for, for the entire dictatorship. And what we found was that who was carrying out these, these atrocities? Who, who was the perpetrator? And it came directly from the state. So the president himself, and he had a military hit squad known as junglers. So it was the president and this military hit squad called the junglers who would perpetuate most of these crimes. And the president would then use the state organs. So he'd use the National Intelligence Agency, the armed forces, the police, um, the prison services, and so on. Also the um, legislative arm, the legal arm, the National Assembly, we're talking judges, lawyers, and so on. And when we really examined the crimes, we thought, we, we realized it wasn't just the security sector that was targeted, it was also the Ministry of Health so there was, um, I have to say that the president took on a, a demeanor where he felt like he was a god and he had um, powers to, to cure and he felt like he could cure HIV and he had the treatment for HIV. So what he did is that doc persons re um, receiving treatment for HIV in the Ministry of Health were then taken out of their programs and put into a state-run um, program by the president where it was televised on TV. He'd rub some ointment, they'll take concoctions, and persons died from this, whether they died from the treatment or they died being taken off the antiretroviral drugs, the point is that they, um, they died from this, this um, course that the president had taken. And so you have the Ministry of Health. You have the Ministry of Education via a policy on um, the July 22nd scholarship program where young women would be encouraged to take part in a, in a pageant, and then as a reward for winning, they would then um, 
receive a scholarship either to go abroad or to study domestically. Now you could imagine in a country like Gambia where there may not be so many opportunities and people may not be so um, well off that this is a major um, incentive to participate in the, in the pageant program, particularly for young women from socially, economically disadvantaged backgrounds. So the scholarship program did attract these women and the winners went on to then instead of receiving scholarships, they were diverted to work at State House directly under the president, who was then used their presence at State, at State House to rape them and carry out other acts of sexual violence and sexual assault. So that's the, um, so you have the Ministry of Edu um, Health, Education, and then we also have the religious aspect. So the Supreme Islamic Council was asked to police sermons of imams who didn't practice a certain form of Islam that the president deemed was correct. Um, during the dictatorship as well, the president also declared that Gambia was an Islamic state. So this also, um, it, it created a little separation of the Christian, of the Christian um, part of the population. So you can see that this, there was a really a, a reign of terror and fear, intimidation, all of these practices to suppress to suppress freedom of thought, freedom of expression, association, and so on, all of these um, constitutional rights. In terms of the law as well, you know, the Constitution was amended over 50 times, and it was used as a way to keep the president in par. There were no term limits and so on. So there was really this culture of repression, of fear, and what many people described as a culture of silence. And this became the norm for 22 years. In 2016, what happened, there were elections and the collective voice of the, of the citizenship, they were able to vote out Jame. He didn't leave um, immediately. He left in January 2017 and he fled to Equatorial Guinea. So after he left the government in par, they became essentially a transitional justice government. And I think that was the mandate they came in with that we're now a transitional justice government. And they did three things. So the first thing they did was establish, they established three different bodies, let's call them that. And the first body was the Jane Commission. So this commission is much lesser known. And it was really done to investigate the misappropriation of public funds. So in terms of where the president was diverting the money to the state, to, pers to foreign bank accounts and so on. The second was the National Human Rights Commission. So this came into force in, um, under the law in 2017. And this monitors then human rights abuses that occurred after 2017. And it, it's an advisory role for the, for the government now in terms of human rights violations. And the third one, which is perhaps the most popular one, is the Truth, Reconciliation Re and Reparations Commission. And this also was mandated through an act of parliament in 2017. And what happened with the, we call it the TRRC for short. So what happened with the TRRC is that it called witnesses. It called, um, you know, witnesses who were victims, who were perpetrators, who were um, experts. And they all came together and they gave testimony and they said what happened. And after the, the first public hearing was in 2019, if I'm not mistaken, I think January 2019 was the first public hearing of the TRRC. And the TRRC conducted 23 sessions and it produced a report at the end with recommendations for prosecution, recommendations for reparations and victim redress and so on. And that was um, 2021, November, when it submitted the report. And in May 2022, the 25th of May, if I'm not mistaken, the government issued a white paper in response to the TRC re uh, recommendations. There were, I believe, 265 recommendations and all except two were accepted by the government. So that's 2022. And that sounds great when you think about the path that the Gambia has taken. So I have to go back about five years. And I'll go back to 2017 when um, Anna Ked came into the, into the picture. So as I had mentioned before, Anna Ked, of course, we have this, now we have this civic space. We're not the only um, civil society organization that's come together. And we're founded because the executive um, 
director of Anaked, her father was disappeared. So she's a victim herself, a secondary victim if we want to use, if we want to differentiate. And she, her father's disappeared in um, about 2013, I believe, and there's no way to investigate. Um, there's no investigation by the state, of course. The, the, the former president was directly implicated in his disappearance and later what found out to be his killing. And she started this organization as a means to find answers and to start the path to justice. And in, you have to understand, into it, as I mentioned, um, at the beginning of the transitional justice process, the government decided, the new government decided to forego prosecutions, well, not to forego, to start first with the truth process and delay prosecutions. Now, that was a very controversial decision. In the end, that was what they decided. Of course, you know, people felt prosecutions were, should be on the front burner because, you know, evidence could go, you know, burial sites could disappear, witnesses, you know, could die or get old, memories fade, and perpetrators could evade justice. But um, the truth pro it started with the truth process. And what we found with the truth process when it was, um, when it began is that we came in this literally a new landscape. So first of all, you have 22 years of repressive rule and civic space, there's, no, there's hardly a civic space at all. And we come into this new realm and we have to navigate it. And one of the first things we do during the, the Truth Commission, during the TRRC, when we sit down and listen to the testimonies, we realize some of these recordings are running on for eight hours and there's nobody who has eight hours to listen to you know the testimonies of the truth commission and we thought well why not why not redact some of this information and make it accessible for for you know for everyone and as we started doing that we got pushback from um from the from the powers that be that we couldn't continue with this and for us it was really a really difficult <coughs> hurdle to cross because when this happened, we realized this is a new, a new frontier of civic space. But from the other side, in retrospect, we now, we now realize it was also for the government. They didn't know if we would come and frustrate the process, if we would you know, taint it with you know, political leanings. They didn't know how we would handle it, if we would be independent, if we would be objective, and so on. So there was a little bit of a tension between the CSOs and the, and the state in the in the very initial stages of the transitional justice process and this is one of the bar the first barriers that we had to overcome as a as a civil society organization and as we went as we went forward with that i mean if you look at the trrc digest and i know brian you said you'll pro you'll provide a link if you look in the at the session so it's separated by session and if you look at the beginning the first page you'll always see this is not an official document of the truth um, Reconciliation Reparation Commission. We had to make that disclaimer. And we had to do that so, you know, to kind of keep the peace. And it turned out, actually, as we were doing this TRRC digest, we, we, we had an analytical summary of the, of the proceedings. So as the, and we did it parallel to the actual proceedings that were going on. So if session one, let's say, dealt with the 1994 coup, then we're listening to all the, all the recordings, we're making notes, and then the digest is an analytical summary. So the analytical summary has the crimes committed, it has the perpetrators, it has the victims who's test, who have testified and what they said. And it also makes a visual impact. So we have things that kind of jump out at you that are really significant that they've said or that they've mentioned. And as it went on, we realized, well, it came via email. So if you signed up for Anaked's email, you get a little ping once a month or so, or every few months that this was in the inbox. And we realized, well, for transitional justice to be, you know, to, to have local ownership, it must be for the masses. And what we did then was we got the um, digest translated into four local languages, Mandinka, Wolof, Jola, Fula, I believe. And then we disseminated it via radio. So it went then via radio, and that way people without internet access, people who are not based in Banjo, a wide cross-section of people could listen. And that was a significant step because it started a process of local and local engagement with the transitional justice process. It became for everybody. 
And building on from that, um, in terms of the analytical summaries of the, of the recordings of the Truth Commission, we worked with students, 90% of whom were young women, and we worked with two universities, um, Columbia University in the US, in New York, and with the University of Gambia itself. And what we, from that experience, we had a cohort of young, in, young people who were engaged with transitional justice, and there was also a transitional justice expert working on this, which meant that they, they developed the language and the, and the know-how to kind of communicate the, the things that they were writing. And because they were young women, we really tried to focus on the gender mainstreaming aspect of the TRRC. And as the TRRC progressed, the digest progressed, then we realized that the commissioners themselves would ask, well, when is the next one coming out, you know? And it, they also um, were reading it and they were engaging with it and they were seeing the, the critiques and the, the ways that they could think about the things that were on the table. And, you know, it really became this expansive tool. And for us, in terms of taking up the, in terms of broadening our, our ambit as an NGO, this was the first thing that we did as, an, as a CSO that really put us on the map. And these, um, the, the TRRC digests are available online, they're by session, and it created a digital archive. So we essentially have a self-made digital archive of the truth process that's available. At, after the 23rd session, we did a final report, and the final report also um, it mapped the victims, it mapped the locations of where the atrocities took place, and it was in a visual and also translated to French. So we had a, a French version. And for us, this was an amazing frontier to overcome because we had that initial pushback and we were able to persevere and you know, make a name with the, with the TRRC Digest and enter this digital space. Now, when the truth process finished, there was a little bit of momentum lost because the truth process kept so many people engaged. And then when it ended, it was almost like a lacuna. And for us as an NGO, it was like, okay, well, what do we do next? And we realized that we had to get out there. We had to get out there and get our hands dirty. So we decided, let's go into the communities and talk to people, talk to victims. Because the thing with... Um, with, with the crimes that happened is that, well, obviously with the truth process, is that people were afraid to come, come forward. And sometimes the ones who come forward are the ones who don't mind sharing their stories, are the, the advocates, the chatters, you know, like the ones in the organization were very chatty, so it's, it's fine. But there are stories that we hadn't heard, and we were really interested to know what stories we hadn't heard. So we went out into the communities and by the communities, I'm calling this like mission beyond Banjul. We went outside of the capital and we found communities with women. So we're a women-led and women-run organization. And this came to our advantage because when we went out in the communities, the way someone responds to me as a woman is different than in a patriarchal society especially. It's different from how they may respond to a man. And the women would sit down with us and they would tell us things. They would say, um, well, you know, my husband disappeared and I, he went out one day, he was taken, I don't know where he is. I heard from a relative, he may be at X prison. And in order to get information on him, I had to have sex with X, with this prison guard, or I had to do a sexual favor. And you realize, well, these women, they're talking about different crimes. There's the crime of the disappearance, potentially a killing, but also of a, you know, sexual violence. So we realized there was this, there was a mixed, a mixed bag of violations. We also realized um, when we spoke with, with women survivors that many of them don't come to the forums because they're excluded in a patriarchal society. So they sit on the, the edges and they won't talk. And we found out also that um, they, don't, they don't know that they're victims. They don't know that if you have a relative who's been disappeared, that you're also considered a victim and what that may mean in terms of redress. And what we also found in terms of speaking with these women was that many of them, they had needs beyond, the, beyond justice. So of course they might say, yes, I would like you know, justice for my missing relative. But they talk about things like, well, now I'm the breadwinner of the family and I can't afford to send my kids to school. I am now dealing with the emotional trauma of a child who has, who has no idea where their father has been. 
I'm dealing with relatives who may want me, you know, out of the property, or I'm dealing with um, relatives who are upset that I've remarried or want to, you know, move on in defense. And we, we thought, well, in terms of our approach going out there in terms in, in advocacy, that we have to take a multi-pronged approach because when Anaked was started, our focus was really on punitive justice and getting justice for the victims in terms of prosecutions. And we realized that when we advocate and go to the go to the government or go to other fora, that we have to take a broad picture because we're having we're seeing legal legal um, reform is necessary in terms of prosecution. We're seeing that there's a need for institutional reform in terms of having a certificate or some kind of document that says, well, this person has been declared missing. Um, you know, socioeconomic reform. These are women who are now breadwinners of their families and they need livelihood support. They need support to send their children to school. So we then took a, a complete and full, a full view of a, practically a more expansive view than we had initially of the steps that we wanted to take as a CSO. And in doing so, we decided to form alliances with other CSOs. So the reason for that is, as the name suggests, we focus really on extrajudicial killings and enforced disappearances. We didn't really want to bite off more than we could chew in terms of our mandate. So then we started to form victim alliances. So then where are the intersections? So you're seeing, okay, women are talking about a relative being disappeared and they were sexually violated. So let's liaise with CSOs that deal with that. Let's um, go forward with CSOs that work with, with lawyers and you know, prosecuting and so on. And it started in this snowball that we began to grow and grow and grow. And it developed into a consortium of CSOs that were able to put forward unified plans to, to the state and say, well, these are our, not demands, but these are the things that we're seeing and it's a coherent plan, which then of course helps the state in terms of receiving all of that because they're not hearing disjointed things and it's sort of streamlined. So that also really helped us in terms of crossing that barrier and chipping away at that, that tension between the CSOs and the state and realizing that if we take a collaborative approach, we could actually get forward. And we've been very fortunate in that respect to have been able to step into that space and, and really be treated as equals with, the, with, the, um, with some of the state institutions. So that's been one of the areas where we've been really happy. And in doing so, we've been able to kind of bring the victims along with us. So we've said, well, you know, enforced disappearance as a form of torture. This is one of the, the areas that we're really focusing on now, torture and understanding torture. And we said, well, you know, not knowing where your relative is for many years, you know, this is a form of torture. You have no closure. Also, um, women who've been detained, sexualized forms of torture. We've seen this also in our, in our, um, in our work as we go out in the community. I mean, think one thing about women is that we tend to minimize harm. We tend to minimize the harm to ourselves when we talk about others. The focus is on you know the other and not so much on ourselves. And we found that women would have been detained. In some cases, they were pregnant, they've miscarried, and um, of course, they've you know, lost the baby, but they, they won't really, they may mention it just as a footnote and not as a, you know, the real, the, the main thing, the main event that happened. So we found that we had to really shift this discourse and bring these women to the, to the forefront. And what we found in this is that our civic space then is growing. So in terms of coming in first with the TRRC Digest, we have this very enclosed area, this bit of mistrust. Everybody's watching their back. You don't know what the other is going to do and what anybody's agenda is. And now it's expanding because now there's a place for victims to sit at the table. A wide range of victims, CSOs are you know, being welcome and there's not this, this significant pushback. And that's one of the, so this was about um, 20, 2018, 2019. And we thought, well, we have to really keep this momentum going and keep pushing. And one of the things we realize in victim advocacy is always better if the victims can really advocate for themselves. And one of the things we thought is that we have to build the capacity. So we're asking, um, of course, our donors, how can we build the capacity? And we're looking at the pool of um, the, the working pool in the, in the country. And one of the significant things of a dictatorship, of course, is that there's brain drain. There's many people who are leaving, whether by choice and self-exile or whether by force. So you don't have professionals there who can really step in and say, okay, well, 
now we are your TJ experts. But we had to build this capacity um, on the ground because what we're realizing is that a lot of donors, they don't want to particularly fund capacity training. So in terms of building this on the ground, what we did was we looked at, we looked at our neighbors and we thought, so if you know where the Gambia is, we're surrounded by Senegal. So we looked at our neighbors and we thought, well, look, let's see who could, who could help us. And the response was astounding. So we have developed partnerships with CSOs in, um, in South Sudan, in um, Sierra Leone, in Senegal, in Ghana, and um, Rwanda, South Africa, other contexts, other um, countries that have gone through trans some sort of transitional justice process, Uganda, and so on, Kenya. And in doing so, we essentially created a consortium, a self-consortium of, of organizations in the South who can answer each other's questions, who could provide capacity, who are at different stages, who could even say, well, these are best practices. This is what we found in our context that worked. This was a mistake we've made, and this is the best way to move forward. So this was, these were some of the things that we found in terms of going beyond, this is beyond Banjo part two, going outside of the country. This is one of the things that was really key for us in terms of expanding that, um, expanding that frontier. And it was just incredibly significant to have that consortium built at the ground level because it came at a really critical time, I've found personally, in the transitional justice shift, which is in inter uh, generally in international development, I would say, that we're going from a, a culture of big organizations coming in on the ground and saying what to do, and they're rather saying, well, look, here are the resources, and you can do it. You, you, know, you have the skills, you have the know-how, you know the domestic context. And it was a really critical time that we found partners, as Brandy said at the beginning, who were willing to work with us and respect our knowledge and our local knowledge and help us build from the ground up, who provided the resources, whether they were financial, whether it was technical, where the capacity was lacking, and really helped us build from the ground up this, and in this global consortium that we've had. And one of the things that I chat with Bryony about all the time is that sometimes in building experts on transitional justice, a lot of the focus is on the big, um, the big cities and the big areas of the world, which many times the average person does not have access to. So for example, for us to get a victim to come to Geneva, it will take a lot of paperwork to make that happen. And it shouldn't be prohibitive. So it's really important to our cause that we shift this narrative to, um, to our continent, to the continent. So if, for example, we have Gambia that just, um, it just passed um, the law that says, you know, you don't need visas to travel to the Gambia if you have an African passport. So this makes a significant difference in terms of the mobility in the continent itself that experts can meet and talk and really sort out the, the problems and build a, build a best practice um, from the ground up. So this is one of the areas where we've kind of, re we've really had a push through and a big breakthrough and we're, we're, um, we're really happy with that. Um, so in terms of building up on that, and it's always like a snowball, we start locally and small and make big and big incremental steps. And moving on from that, what we've realized as an organization is that we have this knowledge. And I talked about the shift in culture from organizations now, they're not so much coming in from the top and saying, okay, now you do this. And what, we've, what we realize now is that we also have a knowledge we've built up over the last five years of our work, well, not five years, longer than five years now, um, eight years, no, seven years, seven years, I didn't do math, seven years of our work, we've built up this experience and this experience is really worth something. And this experience is what led me here today um, when I had a chat with Bryony and I told her, this is the work my organization is doing. We would be so interested to place this in the context of academia. We may not have the terms to describe what we do, but we want to sit now and reflect on what we do and its impact in the world and how that may be studied or looked upon by, you know, by the best minds in the world. And in terms of that, we've really, we've really discovered that we also have a knowledge that we can share. And it's not just to say that, um, you know, it's not, it's, our knowledge is, is less than or, or so on. 
And this was a, a significant step for us in taking us from, so we've gone you know, in the, in the civic space in the Gambia, we've gone beyond Banjul into the wider community, we've gone to our neighbors and asked for help, and we thought now we go outside. And we say to the world, world, we have this knowledge, you know, come and look at us and what we're doing. And in terms of doing that, I mean, of course, the, the first, the first uh, pushback that we had was really getting, getting this together in a, in a, how do I say, in a, in a way that we could pocket it and say, hey, this is what we're doing. But also we had the challenge of streamlining it. So the, the reality of the work that we do is very mixed. It's mixed. We do, um, you know, there's monitoring evaluation, there's advocacy, there's law, there's so many things in the pot. And trying to take it down and put it into an academic program, it has been, of course, a challenge in terms of, you know, academia has, you know, more neat categories, of course, and modules and strict things, and it doesn't work like that in, in practice. But we've been really, we've had a really good relationship in dissecting the things that we do, reflecting on the work that we do, and seeing how that fits into to the work that's being done in research. And one of the things, I, it was Bryony who taught me this term, epistemic injustice. And for us, when we, when, we, when we realized what that meant, we thought, oh, hallelujah, this is exactly what we're trying to, to combat as in our organization. And it gave us the, the confidence to go forward. So in terms of um, going out into the global sphere, one of the things that Anna Ked we've been able to do is speak now to universities, academies, institutions. And we've just had a session in Geneva with, uh, with an academy there. And we've gone and presented to, to their um, master students in transitional justice. And we've been able to say, this is what happened in the Gambia. This is how we dealt with it. And it was such a rich exchange. And this is what we want now. We want to have a rich exchange with various stakeholders in various um, in various parts of the world and in different institutions, not just in um, you know activism or policy making per se, but also in the academic in the academic field. And for us, this was a really a really crucial step in Anaked's in Anaked's development. And what I want to say here then is just in terms of going forward into the global, we also looked at the way that we put out the information. So going back to the beginning, one of the things that we learned with the TRRC Digest in terms of impact. So the TRRC Digest, if I could brag a little, it's actually used in universal jurisdiction trials. So there are three universal jurisdiction trials going on at the moment. There is um, there's one in the US, one in Germany that has finished, um, and one currently under underway in Switzerland. And in these three universal jurisdiction trials, we've had the, t the judges go to the TRRC Digest and they've seen um, what's been said in, in the Truth Commission. So it's, it had a really good use. And what we really want to do is take that, take that knowledge from the, from the things that we've, that we've put out and really think about going forward how we advocate for our, how we attract attention because Many people, when they talk about Gambia, they don't know that there was for 22 years a dictatorship. And what we've had to do is capture attention really quickly to the global audience because the global audience moves on very quickly. And if you don't have a conflict that is always under the microscope, I'm talking about Ukraine, I'm talking about Israel, Palestine, this is when things move on, then that's that. And we've not even had that bit of attention where we've been the focal point. And what we've started to do is really focus the advocacy. So one of the, one of the key things we've done is um, a film, a film called I Cannot Bury My Father. And, it, and if you have time, I, I do encourage you to watch it. It's, it's short, it's only 30 minutes less than actually. And the film follows a, a young man who lost his father. Um, so just the background story really quickly. During the 22 years of the dictatorship, the president became a bit more paranoid in terms of um, military takeovers and coups and so on. He thought um, there were many enemies. And there were a group of West African migrants, about 67 or so of them, and they were moving through Gambia on the way to um, Europe. So they came from, when they arrived in Gambia the, on boat, the plan was that they would then take a boat further and go um, 
up the Atlantic through the Mediterranean and then to Europe. And they were suspected to be mercenaries, although after police investigation, they were found to be migrants. So they were found to be migrants. They had um, euros on them. They were, also, they were also connected to a known smuggler. So it was very clear when the police did their investigation that they were, that they were not mercenaries. In any case, they were killed by order of the president and they were shot. They were, they were driven into the forest. They were shot and the bodies dumped. And one of those um, men, his son, we did a documentary on him and it was called I Cannot Bury My Father. And the documentary really exposes the, the what I would say is the, the cultural impact of not being able to bury your father. So he's talking about the grief, of course, He's talking about the crime, of course, but he's also talking about the cultural significance of not being able to bury a loved one. And this is something that we wanted to show the world because it was really significant for us because when you look at the Gambian context, compared to other contexts, you'll see, well, there were 30 people who died in the presidential alternative treatment program. There were 100 and something people who, who disappeared or were extrajudicially killed. And those numbers are relatively small when you compare them to crimes that took place in, you know, the former Yugoslavia or they took place, you know, in other contexts. This is this is nothing. So in order so sometimes it's really difficult to attract attention when you think, you know, it's really nothing. And what we did is we humanize the stories. And that's our focus on humanizing the victim. Because when you humanize the victim, it's really difficult to think of them as just a number and just a statistic. And when we, the emotive element of that film is, has really been one, uh, such a significant impact in the way we do our advocacy. And when Isaac, that's the name of the, of the victim, of the son of the person who had died, when he's talking about he can't bury his father, he's really talking about what that means in terms of moving forward, what that means in his culture, what that means for the spirit of his father who, you know, has not been given a proper burial. And it's one of the things that we really do in our advocacy when we say we're victim-centered, victim-focused, and we really want to capitalize on that and send that out into the world. Um, finally, I know I'm running out of time, but I just wanted to mention also that we, that one of the things Anna realized we had to do in terms of, you know, taking up space when we think about bringing victims to the fore, when we think about, you know, our work beyond the borders, beyond, you know, Banjul, beyond the borders, we also realized very literally that we needed a physical space and we needed a place where we could just show our work and really be based as an organization. And what we did is that in 2021, we got Memory House. And Memory House is a memorialization, um, uh, it's actually a site of conscience, it's a recognized site of conscience. And Memory House houses um, artifacts of the disappeared. It houses um, their ID cards, sometimes we have bact baptismal certificates. We have items that the family members have given us to display. They've spoken about, about their loved ones. And Memory House is extremely significant, not, not just as a site of conscience, but really as a place where people can come and remember the victims or talk about them, talk about what happened. And at Memory House, we also don't sugarcoat. We have a room for um, victims, perpetrators, where there was that mix. So we also deal really head on with the, with the difficult aspects. And people have a, a chance to come and honor the, the victims. And that's really important because impunity is, is still an issue in the Gambia. You have persons who've come before the TRRC, they've confessed to killing crimes, and they're still at large in society. It's a very small society. People can see their perpetrators, you know, just going to functions. There's, um, if you listen to some of the podcasts of the victims, they'll tell you, well, I saw my perpetrator, you know, he's driving a taxi, and life just goes on for them. Whereas a victim is sitting there, you know, you're suffering, and there's no prosecution, and the perpetrator is not being punished. So it's also a bit of catharsis to have this place where victims can come and they can remember the um, remember their loved ones, or um, of course, you know, learn about learn learn about what happened. Memory House as well. We decided that we have to in term we have to really give back. So. The, there's a strong connection with schools. We do a lot of outreach with schools, with youth groups, 
and it's a constructive space to have human rights dialogue. And we start with children. We actually have a manual for school children. Um, it talks about what are human rights, what are some of the instruments of human rights in ways that they can understand and you know what it means if something is legally binding and, and so on. And this has been a crucial part for us because as the, as the Gambia has the Never Again campaign, unless we, I know we had this conversation about looking at the past, but unless we really look at the past, we also have to look to the future and who's coming and what that, what that impact means for the, for the future generation coming. So it starts a human rights focused education for, um, for children and also civic engagement, particularly um, children of school age, I'm talking pre-adolescents. And this has been a really important target group for us at, at Memory House. And um, so creating this physical, having this physical space for us has been key because in, in terms of combating impunity and I mean even memorialization being you know, named the fifth pillar of transitional justice is very key for us to have this space where victims can really come together. And um, well, I just, I'll wrap up there. But I just wanted to say that, um, you know, thank you, Bryony, again for this for this opportunity to to discuss our work and so on, and that as we go into the accountability mechanism, I mean, our work is still cut out for us. We still have a long road to travel. We're pretty much still at the beginning, but I feel it. I feel it's a lot more promising than when we started. We have buy-in. We're really. Um, we have the support of the, for example, the Ministry of Justice. We see them as partners as we go forward. Um, and we can sit in these consultations with victims, also with you know, the state and other stakeholders and really give our position. And this has been key to, to going forward. And I mean, of course we expect there will be roadblocks, there will be problems and so on. But as we expand, we're really, we're really happy with the, with the with the path that has been built and all the work that has been done. So yeah, it was a pleasure to really share that with you. And if you have any questions, do feel free to ask. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs>